Today on Seculo, the revenge of the Taliban. Keeping you informed and engaged, now more than ever. This is Seculo. We want to hear from you. Share and post your comments or call 1-800-684-3110. And now your host, Jordan Seculo. Hey, welcome to Seculo. Uh, folks, we've got a special broadcast for you today. We started documenting the Afghan withdrawal and what became a disastrous withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan, resulting in uh, the loss of life, of course, of our U.S. troops, but also a horrendous uh, catastrophe inside Afghanistan that continues on to this day, the persecution of religious minorities like Christians, but also the, the, the treatment of women. Uh, we know that because of the, the Taliban takeover and the way it was handled, the fall of Kabul happening in 48 hours rather than 90 days. I, this, this, you know, the fleeing of the Afghan government, the the Afghan military, in a sense, giving up arms as they were unwilling or just unable to fight uh, the Taliban and, and the full uh, and everything that came with it. So, my brother Logan was has been sitting down with a lot of unique individuals with different points of view. So, you're going to see a little mix of this today, Logan, because this is available for people to watch in long format. Right. What we're trying to show up today is. A mix of who was there. It's people like Mike Pompeo and Rick Rennell, who people are used to on our broadcast, but also Tulsi Gabbard, Mike Walt, uh, John Ashcroft, coming back. So people that were there from the very beginning yeah, of this conflict, too, terror, yeah. uh, to Nikki Haley. Yeah, it was a really uh, fascinating thing to do. We sat down and interviewed these people. Originally, it was done. We thought we were going to make a you know, 90-minute documentary. It ended up being a over four-hour series uh, that we released and we did it in real time. So we were doing it as the conflict was unfolding. So to me, it was a, a fascinating time to get people's raw emotions. And it is available right now for the first time ever uh, in its totality on YouTube. And every episode will be released. The entire uh, series of this limited series will be released by the end of this week. So we've been rolling them out you know, one a day. And it's a 10-episode. Again, most, most of the interviews are between 25 to 35 minutes that you can sit down and watch, sort of in podcast form. I'd say in some ways they're mostly interviewed, though there is music and incredible score, and there's B-roll, so you get a little bit more engagement. But I hope people will like it. As you said, uh, there's even people that you're going to agree with that you're going to disagree with, and that was intentional. We wanted to get people's point of views from a bit of our realm and then a bit outside of our realm. So you'll have a conflicting version of what should happen maybe from a Tulsi Gabbard than you would from a Mike Waltz. You have two different, both uh, veterans, both with uh, great careers in the military, but both with two different ways on how we can proceed uh, in Afghanistan. And, of course, a lot of this was done in August, September, October of last year. Uh, so, again, it feels very real, feels very raw for our team, for Rick Rennell, uh, for Mike Pompeo, and then, they like said, John Ashcroft, who was there since the beginning. And then you even have you know, Wes Smith, who is you know, one of our uh, people here on our panel, but he created at Dover the dignified transfer, essentially where the bodies are transferred uh, if, if you've fallen in, in warfare, if you're fallen, you're brought over in this whole situation. He explains how that entire uh, project was created and how running that was obviously an incredible emotional experience. So really great insight, very interesting. Uh, and like you said, it's available on our YouTube channel. Yeah, so people get it so on our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash official ACLJ. Shows the production that we do in this longer format, longer discussion than you can even do. We always talk about radio, how we can have a longer discussion than cable news. This is a longer discussion than we could even do on our broadcast, sitting down with one individual, uninterrupted, and, and talking. Take, I mean, you're going to people who were there in the White House from the day that war began, from people who were fighting in that war, people who were dealing with the bodies coming back from the war, American soldiers, and who were still active duty, uh, who were representing the U.S. U.S. at the U.N. I mean, th this again, you're gonna you do. You see it from so many angles, and we now know this was foreshadowing. Some pretty disastrous international policy, foreign policy, and military decisions by the Biden administration. So we're living with right now as we speak. But I encourage you, as you see this special broadcast today, to support the work of the ACLJ. This shows more of our breadth, more of what we're able to put together, and the people uh, we have access to. Support our work at ACLJ.org. Double the impact of your donation this entire month of March. We have a group of donors. They'll match every donation that comes in through the month of March. So $20 donation is like 40, 50 is like 100 at aclj.org. Donate today if you're financially able to at aclj.org. We'll be right back.
I was at a board meeting at Juice for Jesus, and the executive director said, we've got a case. The Supreme Court had just granted review. It was about literature distribution at airports. We wanted to have the Bible study meet in the school, but it turned into a problem when the principal said, no, you can't have it. I told her that I wanted to sing Noel, and she said, the principal said that we can't have anything to do with Christ in our songs. We marched around the country defending evangelism in Chicago, in Boston, in New York, Atlanta, Texas, uh, Southern California, Northern California, and points in between. We got a letter one evening from the IRS saying, they wanted all this information that I that we all knew immediately was not right. How do you fight the government? How do you fight the IRS? Tea Party groups say they're being targeted by the Internal Revenue Service and they're enlisting the aid of the American Center for Law and Justice. They were trying to shut groups down that they disagreed with. This was very, very serious. The federal courts do not need to become monitors of state trespass actions, and that's all this is. We were looking for the right to speak our minds and our consciences and we won that right today. Religious persecution is a situation where your life is literally put in jeopardy simply because of what you believe. Can you help? Can you do something? He's on death row and so we launched an international campaign. His freedom now rests solely on diplomatic efforts by the United States government and world leaders dedicated to human rights. The release of Andrew Brunson. He is the American evangelical from North Carolina, held in Turkey for more than two years. There was an Air Force plane that came from Germany that had been on standby. We're flying and they finally left Turkish airspace. It's like, okay, we're really out of Turkey and, and free again. Intelligence community has assessed that the Afghan government will likely collapse. That is not true. The first big city to fall was Kunduz. One after another, Afghanistan's biggest cities outside of Kabul were captured. Herat to the west. Terrorists in Kabul carrying out the deadliest attack on U.S. troops in over a decade. Afghanistan is lost. Freedom came under attack. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes. At my direction, a small team of Americans carried out the operation with extraordinary courage. They killed Osama bin Laden. Al-Baghdadi is dead. It's time to end America's longest war. We'll do it responsibly. Rushing to the airport, behind them, the sound of gunfire. Deliberately. Countless Afghans who helped American troops were left behind. In safety. Afghans, by the thousands, desperate to escape life under the Taliban. I'm sitting down to talk with Senator James Lankford of Oklahoma. Senator Lankford currently serves as chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Regulatory Affairs and Federal Management. He's worked fervently to defend religious freedom both here in America and abroad. Senator Lankford was directly involved in the ACLJ efforts to bring home and prison Pastor Andrew Brunson from Turkey and Pastor Brian Naren in India. Senator Lankford will be joining us today to talk about his plans to bring Afghan refugees escaping the Taliban to Oklahoma. Senator, I wanted to uh, get your feedback over the last few weeks. Obviously, we were coming off of a weekend where uh, we, we uh, memorialized the last 20 years since September 11th, uh, a time when, for those of us that lived through it, you know, it is kind of those moments where you realize that a lot of us, a lot of people even in this crew here, uh, were two and three years old when some of this stuff was happening. But for those of us that lived through it, we saw a very uniting moment for America. Uh, nine months into a Bush presidency, you now go 20 years in the future, or nine months into a Biden presidency, uh, tragedy happens related to that. And it's really unfortunate to, wait to see where the country has gone in the last 20 years in forms of, of uniting over certain things. But maybe, and you can kind of touch on this, do you feel that there was maybe uniting, not necessarily for the administration, but in uh, seeing sort of the horrors that were coming out of Afghanistan? There were, and I would tell you, uh, talking to so many veterans of the war in Afghanistan, 
over the last couple of really weeks now, uh, I hear two things that come up over and over and over again. Number one is they're shocked by how people, uh, how, what they see of what we left in Afghanistan, uh, how painful it is to be able to see what was left on the table there, how they abandoned Bagram Air Force Base, how they abandoned the embassy. Uh, all those things, there's just a lot of frustration on and uh, what they actually saw there. And they know we were going to get out of Afghanistan. No one assumed we were going to be in Afghanistan forever. But the way that we got out is very, very, very painful. And the second thing I hear from people over and over again is there were a couple of people that were fighting alongside of me that were Afghans, uh, that they put their lives on the line just like I did. It's that they weren't armed. They were a translator and they were traveling with me. We always told them that if this goes sideways and the Taliban take over, we're going to get you out safely. And uh, they were pretty frustrated by that. So they're frustrated about how it ended. They're frustrated with what we spoke to the rest of the world and to some of those translators that work with us and side by side with our military forces uh, and what they've continued to be able to see from there to see us literally as a country abandon Americans in Afghanistan and abandon individuals that fought alongside of us. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you touched on something I think that's important. And uh, the Afghan people, whether it be the translators or, or people that fought alongside Americans, uh, were kind of metaphorically thrown under the bus from the Biden administration as you know, people who, who you know, abandoned ship, ran away quickly. Uh, that's the opposite of what I've received in these interviews that I've conducted over the last few weeks. Uh, it seems like very compassionate people, very sweet people. And we as Americans are compassionate people. I think conservatives often get labeled uh, in a way that I don't really appreciate because we can all look to that those scenes that happened a month ago and uh, see the horrors that they were and say, how can we help? What can we do? I know you were one of the people who uh, discussed taking in refugees in Oklahoma, uh, a somewhat controversial thing, uh, but not really. You know, I think for you, know, it becomes a very uh, loud minority online that people think represents conservatives or Republicans and think these are not compassionate people who don't want help. I want to know, though, what was your decision making to come to that conclusion? Because, look, in some of the states, uh, and some other people in, in your own party uh, have have taken an opposite approach. So I would say that the first thing that came to my mind was that all these different uh, veterans of the war in Afghanistan, they came to me and said, these are folks that I know. They fought alongside of me. I know them. I know their families. Uh, these are folks that laid their life on the line. These are freedom loving people. These are the folks that are fighting against the Taliban. These aren't terrorists. Right. These are the exact type of people that we want to advance and that we want to be able to support. And so the, how I came to that decision was talking to so many veterans of the war in Afghanistan and what they were saying about those individuals and how they want them to be able to get out. So that's the first part. The second part is in Oklahoma, we took in a lot of uh, Vietnamese 48 years ago when they were fleeing during that time period. Those are thriving members of our community at this point. Very engaged. We have lots of Vietnamese churches in Oklahoma. We have lots of communities that are engaged and business people and all kinds of folks. We did this as a state five decades ago with the Vietnamese. Uh, we will do this again with Afghans that are coming in to our country. And in Oklahoma, we'll probably have about 1,800 to 2,000 Afghans uh, that will move into Oklahoma. Those should be vetted individuals. Those should be folks that have worked alongside of our military, worked alongside of our State Department. I don't want to just randomly grab uh, people in Afghanistan to be able to move to Oklahoma. They need to be fully vetted. They need to go through the process. But most of these folks that, uh, that are moving this direction are exactly that. For those that are not fully vetted, they don't need to come to the United States at all until we know who they are and what their background is and how they were trying to be able to flee out of Afghanistan. That says a lot about you, though. It says a lot about the state of Oklahoma that you guys would support uh, this kind of move in general. I think that uh, it's the Christian thing to do as someone who I know is uh, a person of faith, that it's important to to disconnect maybe you know partisan politics and actually look at the heart of it. because. I, I know about you and, and other people, you couldn't watch the children being passed over the gates. You couldn't watch those things happening in military and to take them uh, even before there was the, the ISIS attack and not say, how can I help? And I think a lot of people uh, can turn to the, you, the administration, to the presidential administration and say, how can I help and feel like they have no answers. But there are people like you, uh, Senator Langford and the Senate, and there's people in Congress who are saying, okay, the administration may be failing us right now, but you have a voice and you represent a people. And I think that's that's got to be an important step for, for anyone right now to really look to their local representation. Yeah, th this should be a moment that nonprofits and churches should step up and say, what can we do to be able to walk alongside these families? Because it's one thing to say, these folks are coming in destitute, afraid, escaping from the ruthless Taliban. We got them out of that environment. It's another thing for the churches and nonprofits to be able to 
and other entities to wrap around them and to say, what are we gonna do to help you integrate in society and to be able to make sure that you have connection points here. And again, again, many of these refugees are not coming to America, they're coming to other countries as well. Uh, so, but those that do come to the United States, we need to make sure that we actually engage and that, that we make sure we show them, for me, the love of Christ uh, to those individuals, uh, but to also be able to make sure that we help them to be able to survive through this time period, a pretty amazing transition for them, as a, not just as a country, but as a family, as an individual. Absolutely, and you look back now, it's been roughly a month when we're recording this. I wanted people to see the raw emotions that were coming out of people and remember that this in a year, in two years, in three years, in 10 years, uh, because it's so easy to look at 9-11 and sort of this historical viewpoint now, uh, pre-social media, pre uh, the way that we kind of have to run our lives now. And I want to make sure that these kind of interviews were, were preserved. So regardless of what happens years from now, that people know the intention that was coming out of people like you and were coming out of uh, beyond Washington. Folks, let me take a minute of your time here because this is a really critical month for the ACLJ. Uh, when we launch in the new year, this the first month of March, it's a matching challenge month. It's when you hear us more often. We don't do it a lot on our broadcasts, but these months it is important because the ACLJ, of course, is a 501c3 organization. We exist because of your financial support. This broadcast, all of our attorneys, all of the cases, all of the work we do here in the United States and around the world, including our work in Israel, our work in the Middle East, our work on behalf of persecuted Christians, if we're representing uh, a governor or a state because of a pro-life law, if we are, again, uh, representing the Heritage Foundation in a fight against the uh, employer vaccine mandate, all of those cases we're able to do because of your financial support. And part of that, of course, is this broadcast as well. And we're in a matching challenge this month of March. That means we can double the impact of your donation. Let me explain how that works. So if you donate $15 online at aclj.org right now, uh, we have a group of donors. They're going to match all those donations through the entire month. So your $15 triggers a $15 match. So it's like $30 for us. But all you're donating and all you're charged is $15. And you can donate online at aclj.org. So think about 50 bucks. 50 bucks becomes $100 for the ACLJ because it triggers a $50 match. These are, these are our most critical months of the year. And we like doing it this way so that we don't have to spend a lot of our broadcast doing a fundraising pitch to you most of the year. But these months, we really do have to tell you how we bring you the broadcast, how we bring you all the experts, how we have team members like Mike Pompeo and Rick Rennell, how we're planning on the fight for life. Even after the Supreme Court case, it's all because of your financial support. Be part of our matching challenge at aclj.org today. In my time in service, both as the CI director and the Secretary of State, I watched the good work that the ACLJ was doing here in the States and all across the world. The ACLJ's work at the UN, overseas with the European Court of Justice, is incredibly important. We have on our team lawyers, non-lawyers as well, that are policy experts. They're all engaged in foreign policy issues. We have been focused on protecting the nation state of Israel, particularly before the United Nations. We don't shy away from the battles that are going on at the UN and just complain about them. We actually try to go in and do something positive and actually affect change. The risk of a incomplete or unsolid relationship within the United States of America and Israel is real. Israel is very important to the ACLJ and we will always fight for Israel's rights. We had a series of cases at the European Court of Human Rights primarily dealing with religious liberty. And the Secretary of State, I saw this too, nations that had more religious freedom were on firmer footing. They had better democracies. America has always been the world leader in religious liberties in freedom of conscience and freedom of speech. We've taken the First Amendment and that has been our cornerstone. It's to defend the rights of people of faith and others that are having their rights abused. We not only hold our government accountable, but we hold other governments accountable. You have to keep the battle going when it's not cool anymore. 
when it's not the number one story on TV, you have to actually be committed to finding it out, or else you'll never win. The ACLJ is front and center on this. We're in a matching challenge campaign. Any amount you donate, we get a matching gift for. Your support of the ACLJ enables us to do all of this. Go to ACLJ.org today. That's ACLJ.org. Today I'm speaking with United States Attorney General under President George W. Bush, John Ashcroft. After the September 11th terrorist attacks by Al-Qaeda, Attorney General Ashcroft was tasked by President Bush to take action to make sure another attack never happened again. Prior to that, Attorney General Ashcroft served as the governor of Missouri for nine years, before then being elected to the Senate in 1994. The former Attorney General and Senator has expressed serious concern about the stability of Afghanistan now that the Taliban has taken control once again. It's September 28th, 2021, and we are joined today by Attorney General John Ashcroft, who was there at the very beginning of the war on terror. And we're going to get his point of view on not only the last 20 years, but what the future could hold for Afghanistan and the future of terrorism in this country. Attorney General, thank you for joining us. Attorney General, we just passed the 20th anniversary of, of 9-11, hindsight being 2020. What's your emotions and memories of that day now looking back on uh 20 years of such a tragedy? Well, it's a, a matter of uh, great regret that it occurred. It obviously is something that we should learn from. We should make sure it never happens again or we do whatever we can to displace the resources that were aggregated to make it possible in the first place. Uh, the situation in Afghanistan reminds us of the continuing threat of terrorism especially given the fact that prior to uh, 9-11, 20 years ago, the uh, folks in Afghanistan had been involved deeply with terrorist strikes against the United States, but not so much on uh, American soil. Embassies overseas, the coal uh, and the like, the terrorist groups were uh, resourced and uh, frequently found refuge in Afghanistan. And uh, as a matter of fact, President Clinton had actually uh, fired missiles into Afghanistan as in retaliation for the acts. So 20 years ago, we learned that terrorism could visit our shores from foreign sources. We'd had some incidents of terrorist activity here in the United States. The Oklahoma bombing sure. was one of those. But foreign-based terror became a reality in a way that we hadn't anticipated. When you look at that now, the, you know, following September 11th, there was a great kind of uniting moment in this country. It were 20 years later, roughly a similar time frame of the presidential uh, administration as when President Bush and your administration had to handle the September 11th attacks. 20 years later, very similar to the Biden administration having to handle uh, what was going on in Afghanistan, the exit of Afghanistan. But at that moment, a nation united after September 11th. Do you feel that we can get there again as Americans, that we can be this united country? Because I think a lot of people watching this, including myself, you see the divide growing deeper every day. It doesn't feel like there, maybe we've unified and said, yes, the atrocities in Afghanistan on a big perspective, a lot of people go, well, these are horrible, but it seems quickly people fall back into politics and it, it's a different world. But uh, do you feel that, uh, there can be uniting again for Americans? Well, you would sure hope so. Uh, it took an assault from outside the country by the terrorists, striking New York, striking civilian populations, striking uh, targets which uh, were symbolic of what we are and what we stand for as a nation that united us. And since then, we have been successful in keeping those kinds of things from reoccurring. And as a matter of fact, politics, the good politics at that time was to champion the unity of the United States against foreign threats. Um, some people have come to the conclusion that good politics now is to divide the United States and champion one group in the United States against other groups in the United States, alleging that the United States is not a place that's to be admired or to be a, a focal point of uh, respecting human dignity and human rights, but is a place somehow where they are disrespected and ought to be rejected. And that really has fostered this disunity, which is very, very different than the unity which we experienced, especially that which followed immediately upon the attacks of 9-11. 
we look at that uniting moment, and I mean, it was maybe short-lived. You can say that there were there were times where it became very contentious, very uh, political, politically driven, whether it was the war in Iraq or, or anything that followed. But we're hearing now, uh, coming out of the Pentagon, you obviously were, were deeply involved in this 20 years ago. I think people are trying to just kind of break down what it all means. Because we've had a relative peace, like you said, there hasn't been a major terrorist attack in this country since September 11th. Uh, there has not been... There had been relative peace for for years or quiet coming out of Afghanistan. But now, you know, the Pentagon has said the resurgence of terror in those regions in Afghanistan is is sort of uh, inevitable. What do you say to that to to someone who's been there like yourself, who has been involved in these top level meetings? What does that mean for us as Americans? So if we should be looking out for what is it all, though? It's hard to for there's a whole generation of people who grew up without real even knowledge of of terrorist threats. Well, let me just say this, that uh, the more terrorist activity there is in Afghanistan, the higher the threat is to the United States. The ability to export terror is a um, something that's a result of technology, communications. If you think of threats as being uh, one component being lethality, how lethal they can be, how destructive they can be, and the other is deliverability. Where can you... Now, we were protected by oceans for hundreds of years as a country, but we're no longer protected in the same way. And resources that can be assembled, planned uh, in one part of the world can be deployed in another part of the world. So the defense of America and the ability of America to uh, displace or otherwise default plans to attack America can't exist solely in the United States. We have to be aware of what's happening in other places. And one of the reasons we haven't, I think, had intervening attacks in the United States is that we've consciously taught, sought to fight the terrorists there rather than to fight the terrorists here. And it's a, a problem, obviously, when we have to fight terrorists at all. But I think most Americans would come to the conclusion better that the fighting be there than that the fighting be here. And if we have decided that we're going to just thinking we can wash our hands of terrorism by leaving an environment in which terrorism will flourish and grow and uh, and provide planning resources and perhaps launch potential against the United States, it could be that we would be making a very big mistake to think that we can just turn our backs on what happens overseas. The domestic security of the United States can no longer be controlled and determined totally by focusing inside our borders. Folks, let me take a minute of your time here because this is a really critical month for the ACLJ. Uh, when we launch in the new year, this the first month of March, it's a matching challenge month. It's when you hear us more often. We don't do it a lot on our broadcasts, but these months it is important because the ACLJ, of course, is a 501c3 organization. We exist because of your financial support. This broadcast, all of our attorneys, all of the cases, all of the work we do here in the United States and around the world, including our work in Israel, our work in the Middle East, our work on behalf of persecuted Christians. If we're representing a, a governor or a state because of a pro-life law, if we are, again, uh, representing the Heritage Foundation in a fight against the uh, employer vaccine mandate, all of those cases we're able to do because of your financial support. And part of that, of course, is this broadcast as well. And we're in a matching challenge this month of March. That means we can double the impact of your donation. Let me explain how that works. So if you donate $15 online at aclj.org right now, uh, we have a group of donors. They're going to match all those donations through the entire month. So your $15 triggers a $15 match. So it's like $30 for us. Be part of our matching challenge at aclj.org today. Here's what I want to say to our ACLJ members, or for those of you that are enjoy watching this broadcast, whether it is going after the deep state, whether it is litigation that we're engaged in, whether it is defending the persecuted church and getting individuals out of prison because of their faith in other countries, whether it's training lawyers to fight for religious liberty, not just here in the United States, but around the globe, whether it is producing a daily, five days a week, 
one hour live television and radio broadcast heard on thousands of radio stations, on TV platforms, on social media platforms. Your support of the ACLJ enables us to do all of this. We want to encourage you to support the work of the ACLJ. And when you do that, you're supporting our production teams, our videos, whether it's that kind of production and other things that we are working on. The ACLJ is front and center on this. We're in a matching challenge campaign. Any amount you donate, we get a matching gift for. Go to aclj.org today. That's aclj.org. Keeping you informed and engaged. Now more than ever. This is Seculo. We want to hear from you. Share and post your comments or call 1-800-684-3110. And now your host, Jordan Seculo. Hey, welcome to Seculo. Uh, folks, we've got a special broadcast for you today. We started documenting the Afghan withdrawal and what became a disastrous withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan, resulting in uh, the loss of life, of course, of our U.S. troops, but also a horrendous uh, catastrophe inside Afghanistan that continues on to this day, the persecution of religious minorities like Christians, but also the, the, the treatment of women. Uh, we know that because of the, the Taliban takeover and the way it was handled, the fall of Kabul happening in 48 hours rather than 90 days, I, this, this, you know, the fleeing of the Afghan government, the, the Afghan military, in a sense, giving up arms as they were unwilling or just unable to fight uh, the Taliban and, and the full uh, and everything that came with it. So my brother Logan was has been sitting down with a lot of unique individuals with different points of view. So you're going to see a little mix of this today, Logan, because this is available for people to watch in long format. Right. What we're trying to show up today is a mix of who was there. It's people like Mike Pompeo and Rick Rennell, who people are used to on our broadcast, but also Tulsi Gabbard, Mike Waltz, uh, John Ashcroft, coming back. so people that were there from the very beginning yeah, of this conflict, of too, terror, yeah. uh, to Nikki Haley. Yeah, it was a really uh, fascinating thing to do. We sat down and interviewed these people. Originally, it was done. We thought we were going to make a 90-minute you know, documentary. It ended up being a over four-hour series uh, that we released and we did it in real time. So we were doing it as the conflict was unfolding. So to me, it was a, a fascinating time to get people's raw emotions. And it is available right now for the first time ever uh, in its totality on YouTube. And every episode will be released. The entire uh, series of this limited series will be released by the end of this week. So we've been rolling them out you know, one a day. And it's a 10-episode. Again, most, most of the interviews are between 25 to 35 minutes that you can sit down and watch sort of in podcast form. I'd say in some ways they're mostly interviewed, though there is music and incredible score and there's B-roll, so you get a little bit more engagement. But I hope people will like it. As you said, uh, there's even people that you're going to agree with that you're going to disagree with, and that was intentional. We wanted to get people's point of views from a bit of our realm and then a bit outside of our realm. So you'll have a conflicting version of what should happen maybe from a Tulsi Gabbard than you would from a Mike Waltz. You have two different, both uh, veterans, both with uh, great careers in the military, but both with two different ways on how we can proceed uh, in Afghanistan. And, of course, a lot of this was done in August, September, October of last year. Uh, so, again, it feels very real, feels very raw for our team, for Rick Rennell, uh, for Mike Pompeo, and then, they like said, John Ashcroft, who was there since the beginning. And then you even have you know, Wes Smith, who is you know, one of our uh, people here on our panel, but he created at Dover the Dignified Transfer, essentially where the bodies are transferred uh, if, if you've fallen in, in warfare, if you're fallen, you're brought over in this whole situation. He explains how that entire uh, project was created and how running that was obviously an incredible emotional experience. So really great insight, very interesting. Uh, and like you said, it's available on our YouTube channel. Yeah, so people get this on our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com slash official ACLJ. Shows the production that we do in this longer format, longer discussion than you can even do. We always talk about radio, how we can have a longer discussion than cable news. This is a longer discussion than we could even do on our broadcast, sitting down with one individual uninterrupted and, and talking. Take, I mean, you're going to people who were there in the White House from the day that war began, from people who were fighting in that war, people who were dealing with the bodies coming back from the war, American soldiers, and who were still active duty, uh, who were representing the U.S. US at the U.N. I mean, th this again, you're going to you do you see it from so many angles. And we now know this was foreshadowing. Some pretty disastrous international policy, foreign policy, and military decisions by the Biden administration. Some we're living with right now as we speak. But I encourage you, as you see this special broadcast today, to support the work of the ACLJ. This shows more of our breadth 
more of what we're able to put together and the people uh, we have access to. Support our work at aclj.org. Double the impact of your donation this entire month of March. We have a group of donors. They'll match every donation that comes in through the month of March. So $20 donation is like $40. $50 is like $100 at aclj.org. Donate today if you're financially able to at aclj.org. We'll be right back. When we see something, when we hear something, when we're concerned about an issue, we don't just talk about it. We do something about it. And that goes to our government accountability project. The things that are important are knowing where to look and who to look at. What we're trying to do is get information that we, the people, are entitled to. We sort of call them puzzle pieces because we don't know which ones we're going to need in the long run. But you gather all the puzzle pieces together and then you start to put them together to uncover the truth, really. The Freedom of Information Act, that's a statute that allows us to get information from the government. Starts with a letter from our offices in Washington to these agencies. And it says, give us this information on these topics. And generally, they don't. And then we go to court. We go through a series of lengthy negotiations back and forth about what they'll give or what they won't give. We may get tons of information that's redacted, and we have to then go back and say, you redacted too much. We can't really find out what you're giving us because it makes no sense. So it goes through a process of litigation. That is how you get information, and that office is going to be more active now more than ever. The ACLJ has been extremely active in vigorously seeking to hold these bureaucrats accountable. We have filed hundreds of FOIA requests. We have received over 20,000 pages of documents in our litigation. How was our government operating? What were they driving at? What was their agenda? What was their motive? And I will tell you, I mean, sometimes the picture that it paints is one of terrific abuse. You're finding a nugget in a gold mine. Occasionally, you'll come up with something that is really a bombshell, but you have to persist in doing it, and that's what we do. That is a, that's a, is a little bit of what we do through our Office of Government Accountability, and of course, that comes under our Office of Government Affairs. So your support of the ACLJ supports all of that. I'm joined by former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley. Ambassador Haley served her home state of South Carolina as a congresswoman for six years and then governor for another six years before she was named as U.N. Ambassador by President Trump. For two years, Haley represented the United States on the world stage and has extensive knowledge of international policy and conflict. During her tenure in the U.N., she stood up to nations that sponsor or endorse terrorism and human rights violations such as Iran, Syria, and North Korea. Ambassador Haley has also been a fervent supporter of the state of Israel. It's September 30th, 2021. We are joined today by former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley. And uh, Ambassador Haley, it's great to talk to you today and thank you for taking time. But you know, we're, this whole experiment that we've been doing for the last month, this series has been on everything that's happened in Afghanistan. But, you know, obviously we're going to be talking about the UN. We're going to be talking a lot about what's happened to the UN. But I do want to go back just a little bit because before that you were governor of South Carolina. You were involved in, in politics locally. When you see these images and you're on the ground, you meet people in South Carolina who are, you know, not necessarily just Washingtonians and people who are dealing with politics. You see these images coming out of Afghanistan the last month. What is your reaction to that? Some of these, you know, obviously heartbreaking, horrifying images. And what is it like uh, for the people uh, that you interact with? You know, it's painful um, because, you know, South Carolina is a big military state. I, as governor, watched um, units deploy to Afghanistan. I, as governor, had my own husband deploy to Helmand province in Afghanistan. And so I know the sacrifices that so many military men and women have made. And I know what their families have made. And, you know, for them to watch videos of the Taliban, you know, driving our vehicles, holding our guns and wearing our uniforms all while making fun of Americans is just it's painful to anyone who's ever served there. And the idea that we left them with eighty five billion dollars worth of ammunition and equipment, the idea that we abandoned Bagram Air Force Base in the middle of the night without telling our allies, without telling our Afghan partners, um, the one intel hub that was so important to NATO 
it was reckless. And, you know, now to turn around and have Biden say Al Qaeda is not in Afghanistan when all his generals have said the opposite of that. As a matter of fact, we all know when the Taliban took over, they released all the Al Qaeda prisoners from the prisons for him to say we weren't going to leave any Americans behind. And literally, he put his military against the moral code of you never leave an American behind. Or whether it's the fact that he claimed that the Afghan military could have handled it. You ask any person who ever served there, they could tell you the Afghan military could never do it by themselves. They they had the fight, they had the heart, they had the sacrifice, but they needed leadership to tell them what to do and where to do it. And so it's just been an embarrassment all the way around. When you look at it from the UN perspective, someone who's been there, obviously yourself, uh, we saw the world leaders address the UN just recently. President Biden gave his first address you know the UN practically better than anyone. I'm just curious, contrasting what you've seen and then what you experienced in the previous administration, just contrast that a bit to me. Tell me what that what that feels like to you as someone who's been there. Well, you know, I told someone when I saw Biden's speech, it was the first time that I could say out loud, I was truly embarrassed because I know how those countries think. I know what they expect of us. Um, you know, the the thing that President Trump and all of us did that served him was we made sure that the world knew what America was for and what we were against. We didn't care if they liked this, but we wanted them to understand us. And what I saw were the UN ambassadors very much wanted America to lead. Even if they badmouthed us, they wanted us to lead because they'd rather follow the United States than China or Russia any day of the week. And to see Biden go there not mention China by name, not talk about the new terrorist threat that we have, not call out human rights abuses that were happening in Venezuela, Cuba, China, and so many other places, not acknowledge COVID and say anything about that. There were so many things he left undone, but this was the thing. I did an event on the outskirts of the UN and met a fellow diplomat that I knew. And he said, you know, we all watched to see Biden's speech. And he said, And we all were looking forward to seeing which direction the U.S. was going to go. He said, we're all left scratching our heads. He said, because it was a vanilla speech and it gave us no guidance whatsoever. I mean, it's it's just horrible. I wanted to get to certainly our adversaries or or China or Russia. We'll get to that in a minute here. But let's talk about that and our allies who have relied on the U.S. Look, for a lot of people would say maybe too much, but rely on the U.S. uh, for what they uh, they need are now seeing the imagery, are seeing the verbiage coming out of the president's mouth. And and there is a deep concern, it seems, from even not just our adversaries, but from our allies that the United States may not be uh, the future strong voice that it's been. And uh, how do you combat that? You know, it's amazing that when I was at the United Nations, no one wanted to meet unless the U.S. was in the room. And now you've got the fact that NATO is having meetings and they don't even think U.S. needs to be in the room. I mean, that's how far we've fallen. That's how dangerous it's gotten. And, you know, there's a lot of repairs that need to be made here. And I know Biden came and said at the UN, the US is back, we're back with diplomacy, we're back with all this. You know what, it's not, countries don't want the niceties, that's not what they're talking about. They wanna know you're gonna have their back. They wanna know that you're gonna lead and they can follow. They don't wanna wonder what you're thinking that day when you wake up in the morning. And I think that, you know, you see it where France is trying to tell the EU that they need to become less dependent on the U.S., not less dependent on China, less dependent on the U.S., which is shocking. The idea that the U.S. is now asking Russia for help in dealing with Afghanistan, which is unthinkable. And, you know, the idea that we're not we have no plans on how we're going to go and counter terrorism. And not once did Biden say we should not acknowledge the Taliban as the head of the Afghanistan government. I mean, that was a prime opportunity for the U.S. to lead the charge that we cannot acknowledge the Taliban. We can't give them aid. We can't in any way recognize them. And he missed the mark on that. Right, again. right. And it keeps missing that mark. The, you know, bring back or build back better and America's back coming from the Biden administration. Great words to, to say uh, verbally. But then you see the narrative that presented the U.N. You see the uh, the fumbled horrible withdrawal of Afghanistan, can, those two things can't exist. That, that can't be the, the narrative. You can't have one and the other, it seems. Well, I think what you're going to see is, look, words can get you through the first month of your presidency, but without action, you're not going to get that. Not only has there been inaction, there's been wrong action. 
And so all of our allies see that the world is less safe now. All of our allies see how quickly we folded in Afghanistan. They know we left our Afghan partners behind. They know that we left Americans behind. It goes against anything that they know. And so where do we go from here? Because it's not just complaining. It's what do we do about it? The one thing that I think went well was getting the agreement with the US, Australia um, and the UK to start allowing um, the submarines for Australia so that they can counter China. We need to be doing more of that. We need to get together with the Quad, US, India, um, Australia, and make sure that we're finding out ways with Japan, finding out ways that we can all counter China, that we can all work towards that. And we've got to start talking to our friends and saying, okay, this is what we need to do and this is how we need to do it. But all we're seeing from Biden is, you know, a tax and spend policy that doesn't address foreign policy, doesn't address what average families are going through because inflation has kicked in and it's just really wondering where's the leadership here. Absolutely. And China and Russia, as you said, have been brought into this conversation uh, maybe more than even I anticipated with Afghanistan when the, the withdrawal was happening. But now all of a sudden we're seeing situations that have unfolded with whether you know we're going to be using Russian military bases or, or any of China's interests. We've talked now about our allies, but what about our adversaries? They've been brought into this conversation and we know they both want major influence. So what do we do when we've just abandoned this region? Now, I think you can expect China to go in and make a major move for Bagram Air Force Base. They've wanted the minerals in Afghanistan for a long time. Afghanistan's already said, the Taliban has already said they want to work with China. So we have lost that foothold. I think you're looking, all you got to do is is turn on the TV or open up your utility bills. Natural gas is going up. Russia, Biden just gave him Nord Stream 2, which gives him all the money he needs, all the influence and power he wants, um, and makes our European allies um, more vulnerable and dependent on Russia. So, I mean, I think that Russia hacked um, the U.S. We saw it in the pipeline. We saw it in the food processing plant. I dealt with Russia enough to know that was Russia's way of not hurting America. It was their way of testing us. They wanted to know how we were going to handle it. And Biden literally did nothing, which allowed China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, all those that do realize that that is the cheapest form of warfare. You're now going to see further and further hacks that are more and more serious because Biden has shown he's not going to hold anyone accountable. Folks, let me take a minute of your time here because this is a really critical month for the ACLJ. Uh, when we launch in the new year, this the first month of March, it's a matching challenge month. It's when you hear us more often. We don't do it a lot on our broadcast, but these months it is important because the ACLJ, of course, is a 501c3 organization. We exist because of your financial support. This broadcast, all of our attorneys, all of the cases, all of the work we do here in the United States and around the world, including our work in Israel, our work in the Middle East, our work on behalf of persecuted Christians, if we're representing uh, a governor or a state because of a pro-life law, if we are, again, uh, representing the Heritage Foundation in a fight against the uh, employer vaccine mandate, all of those cases we're able to do because of your financial support. Be part of our matching challenge at ACLJ.org today. Thanks to your support of the ACLJ, we have had many victories. The report is coming out. It shows that not only did Tea Party groups get more scrutiny, but so did a host of other conservative groups. It was something that no one could believe our government was even capable of doing, and now they were admitting it. It's one of the most significant wins in the ACLJ's history. To take on the IRS and win for the ACLJ, life has always been a top issue. Barbara, I am here at this site because there are thousands of people and millions across America that say abortion's murder. When you're fighting for the life of the unborn, you're on the right side of history, you're on the right side of law. These are our young people in their 20s and 30s that are doing this, are fighting for life to beat back the abortion juggernaut. It's very important that uh, we remain hopeful that the courts that the Trump administration was able to impact will give us good rulings that are based in law and sound reasoning. This is one of the social issues we're winning. There are historians that point out that religious persecution is at its highest level since the first three centuries when the Roman Empire led religious persecution. A mid-state pastor's family is fighting to bring him home. We are getting my husband after seven and a half months. <laughs> 
Turkey should not get away with holding my father one more day. When Brunson was finally released, who meets him at the airport at 2.30 in the morning? Rick Brunel. I saw Pastor Brunson walk down the stairs of the plane. I was filled with emotion. I told him that we were praying for him. The American people never forgot about him. I'm thankful, I'm grateful, and actually, I'm astounded. We need your help as we continue this work here in the United States and around the world. Join the matching challenge today, and your tax-deductible donation will be doubled. Today I'm sitting down with ACLJ Senior Advisor for National Security and Foreign Policy and former U.S. Ambassador to Germany, Rick Grinnell. Ambassador Grinnell formerly served as Acting Director of National Intelligence under President Trump. He also served the U.S. at the United Nations under President George W. Bush and holds the record as the longest serving U.S. spokesman in history at the U.N. Grinnell possesses extensive knowledge on foreign policy and national security. Last summer, when we were all talking, Rick, and discussing, we kept saying on the air, no one's talking about ISIS. No one is talking about what's going on in the Middle East. Israel's relatively quiet. All of these situations were relatively quiet. It wasn't even really a topic in the political debate, in the political sphere. But we kept telling people, just wait. Because this seemed, and look, it was just sad to say. It just seemed to be the inevitable. And you look at the 20-year war in Afghanistan, obviously, and, and it's something to speak to, our servicemen, our troops, there were 20 years there of, of successes that did happen, at least 10. You could at least say 10 years successes, maybe 10 years too long, but 10 years of successes. People were there for a reason. And these guys all fought and put their lives on line for a reason. But unfortunately, a lot of people are going to judge this by the ending. You know, it's kind of like a, a movie. The movie can be great until the last scene. And at the last scene, they blow it. You'll never think of that as a good movie. You're going to be like, well, that was horrible. I'm afraid that in many ways, as someone who like you who was involved in the very early stages of this, people will look back and just remember the ending when so many people did give up their lives to not only protect American interests, but to at least do their best in what their mission was at the time. Such a good analogy. And to keep to that analogy, I would say let's let's not focus on the end of the movie. I think that there are so many redeeming characters in this uh, in this movie. And what I would say to every single man and woman who fought in Afghanistan, you won for us. You you gave us a victory. And that victory was stopping terrorism from coming into the United States. That was their goal. They were sent there to make sure that there wouldn't be a, a safe haven in Afghanistan so that the terrorists would never be able to do another 9-11. They wouldn't be able to come at us. We took the fight over there instead of having the fight come to the United States. And the American uh, military won that battle. They did everything right at great cost, incredible sacrifices, limbs and lives. And uh, I think that what we have to remember is that it was the politicians at the end that messed this up. The politicians who decided to keep our men and women there and to change uh, the goal. The goal was no longer just about fighting the immediate threat to U.S. national security, but it was suddenly you know, trying to get little girls to go to school and importing democracy. All noble goals, but I would say that's not what American men and women in the U.S. military should be doing. The State Department was sidelined. USAID was sidelined. Uh, we have to think through these issues uh, more strategically and figure out what part of the US government should be involved. We have a whole huge mission at the United Nations. Maybe it's the US at the UN should be much more involved in getting the UN to do it. Now we know that the UN does not function unless there's US leadership. But uh, maybe we adjust our goals and we, we only include the international community and say, let's do the best we can. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I think uh, just focusing on little girls going to school in Afghanistan, by having the U.S. military there is not enough because little girls in the Congo can't go to school. Where do we stop? We have to have some sort of rules for engagement uh, of, of U.S. military men and women on the ground with guns trying to enforce something. 
And I think that we have to drop back and remember that the goal is just to have U.S. national security not threatened. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point to to start winding down here with you, Rick. And one thing before we we end, I want to talk about you are uh, ambassador to Germany. You involved the UN. You've dealt with our allies. Uh, we're seeing a lot of outcry from our allies. We're saying, uh, you know, responses from MPs in in the UK. We're seeing uh, response from France and from other countries. We're saying this is not how we're going to handle it. And also, we need to not be turning to the US now to help solve our problems. Somewhat you watch that and go, well, these countries should be operating independently. And, you know, it is it is their own country to worry about. But you also worry about the strength of America. You worry about the superpower kind of concept that we've built here. And if they've lost hope, have we lost our allies in these kind of situations when they see how you know horrible we we handled this this big ending in Afghanistan? This is such a big, important, thoughtful question. We could do a whole segment on what the allies have done and and the groundwork that they've laid. I hope that our allies are able to be thoughtful about their role in all of this in the last 20 years, because let's be let's be honest. um, Our allies all have a country first foreign policy and domestic policy in Germany, where I know it well. They have a Germany first policy. Now, they mock America for having an America first policy, but every country around the world has the their own country first as a motto. We're the only country that gets in trouble for actually articulating the America first policy. When Donald Trump was asking other countries to step up and do more, and remember the America first policy is also about allies doing more, NATO doing more, meeting their obligations. We got a big pushback from many allies who didn't want to do more who are very comfortable with America doing the most and leading the way. Many, I can tell you, I spent eight years at the UN. Many of the world's problems uh, are brought to the UN and the UN sits around and waits for the United States to come up with a plan. And then they critique the plan and they say why this isn't good. And then when we finally settle on something, they say America should pay for it. And so this is not something where the allies should escape their own process to say what went wrong and what could we have done wrong. I'll finish by saying this, many allies really wanted Donald Trump out and Joe Biden in because they wanted a softer America. They wanted an America that would govern by consensus and allow them to be uh, participating in these decisions. Well, they got that. They got a leader who doesn't put America first and Clearly, we've seen in Afghanistan a disaster. Now many of our allies are saying, oh, this is terrible. Um, you know, what, what, can ha- what can we do differently? And I would say that they need to look long and hard at why an America first leader like Donald Trump is better for them. And, and I think that's the challenge of our diplomats. When we talk about America first and we go out around the world to represent America first, there's a way to tell other countries why America first is better for them, especially for NATO allies who are part of our commitment to keeping Western values strong. They have to remember that an America first helps protect them. It means greater capitalism for everybody. A, a more solid human rights record for uh, those who want to follow an America First agenda. And it certainly makes the world a safer place. Thanks, Rick. I really appreciate you spending your time and sharing your expertise with all of us. Folks, let me take a minute of your time here because this is a, a really critical month for the ACLJ. Uh, when we launch in the new year, this the first month of March, it's a matching challenge month. It's when you hear us more often. We don't do it a lot on our broadcast. But these months, it is important because the ACLJ, of course, is a 501c3 organization. We exist because of your financial support. This broadcast, all of our attorneys, all the cases, all the work we do here in the United States and around the world, including our work in Israel, our work in the Middle East, our work on behalf of persecuted Christians, be part of our matching challenge at aclj.org today.